I'll now introduce uh, Rachel Smith, who's uh, the next speaker. Um, an artist uh, who's actually, again, conducting research for a PhD in fine art, uh, studied originally fine art at Staffordshire University, then uh, with a little break, did, a, did an MA at Sheffield Hallam, and then has gone on to do a PhD there. The title of the paper is up, The Materiality of Images, and uh, looking at the photograph, the matter of the photograph. Well, the photograph is matter, it's yes, material. So it. thanks, Rachel. Thank you. OK. Um, so um, in my current practice, I'm interested in the hierarchical tension between process and product. Um, as an artist, I use photography alongside writing and drawing as a way of materialising thought processes and language itself. And my current PhD research is concerned with disrupting the processes of narrativising or sense-making through materialising less visible actions around thinking, reading and speaking um, in order to enable ways that we produce meaning and the things that are lost in the act of communication. So materiality is really important to me as a way of exploring production and visualising the thinking process. So today I'm going to talk about more generally um, materiality in photography, um, kind of as a wider exploration of my research. Um, so yeah, I'm going to explore some ideas and pose some questions around the materiality of photographic images through uh, examining examples of creative practice. The debate about materiality in contemporary art and photography has gathered pace recently, but it's not a new idea, so it makes me wonder why this re-emergence has come about. Harriet Richards, writing in the PhotoWorks Journal, points to a development of an object-based practice in recent photography, focusing on sculptural, process-based and hybrid works, and she also poses questions about its relevance. Could this interest in the material nature of photography be connected to the rise of digital media and what Richards refers to as the perceived crisis caused by the death of the analogue? There's certainly been calls for separated taxonomies of analogue and digital media, but is there more to this than just a nostalgic longing for the past? Could this renewed interest signal a shift and re-evaluation of how we approach the image, particularly in the critical dialogue around photographic images? Petra lang Burned, editor of Materiality, one of the Whitechapel documents on contemporary art series, acknowledges that materiality is one of the most contested concepts in contemporary art and is often sidelined in critical academic writing. She puts this down to an attitude in the field of some who view engagement with materiality as the antithesis of intellectuality. However, there does seem to be a growing desire to explore examples of existing critical discourse around this subject, joining theoretical ideas and methodologies in order to enable a critical dialogue around the work that's being produced. I think my own interest in the subject came from my formative experiences of producing and handling photographic images. As a child of the 70s, I first experienced photography through a box brownie. These are my first photographs ever taken. Um, probably at the age of about four or five, I think. Um, in these first attempts, you can see that they're all actually lopsided because of the difficulty of pulling down the lever, but being quite a small child, so they've all got that nice slant on them. Um, so the physicality of the process is actually embodied in the image produced. Other experiences that I remember are the warmth and noise and, in fact, smell of the slide projector in a darkened room, the anticipation of the Polaroid picture and sitting on my mum's knee looking through photo albums that we had of family pictures. Later as a student, learning to produce a, ses a successful photographic image in the darkroom, I spent a lot of my time desperately trying to avoid the marks that signified my presence, the accidental thumbprint of fixative that prevented the smooth and transparent surface of the image, the hair or, or dust in the enlarger that was blown up to enormous proportions in the final print, or the scraped lines of microscopic piece of grit that was caught in the wiping blade when developing the negatives. But now as an artist, it is those frustrations, those marks, and that evidence of process which often becomes hidden in a finished piece of work that drive my own interests. From these personal experiences, it's possible to identify the main strands of materiality in photography outlined by Elizabeth Edwards and Janice Hart in their book, Photographs, Objects, Histories. The plasticity of the image and the presentational forms that surround the image. And both of these are influenced by another material aspect, which is the physical trace of usage in time. Today, I want to focus mainly on the physical attributes of the objects rather than presentational forms and look at the ways that various artists explore materiality, thinking about process making, ideas of intention, distribution and consumption. <clears throat> Camera Lucida is perhaps one of the most influential and commonly quoted books written on photography and in it, in fact, 
think you've already mentioned this quote. <laughs> Roland Barthes famously describes a photograph of his mother, but I'm going to go for the first bit of the, the quote. The photograph was very old. The corners were blunted from having been pasted in an album. The sepia print had faded, and the picture just managed to show. So here he's describing the object itself, the thing he holds in his hand, writing about the ageing surface, the contents of the album, um, and the chemical process that made it, before he then goes on to discuss the actual image. It seems a crucial piece of writing that acknowledges the importance of these material aspects. Uh, yet Bart and many other writers who have theorised about photographic images focus their main attention on the transparency of the photograph in order to an analyse the significance of the image content. Earlier in the same book, Bart states, whatever it grants to vision and whatever its manner, a photograph is always invisible. It is not what we see. It seems that the viewer tends to look at the subject contained in the photograph rather than the object itself. So in the act of depicting something, the photograph potentially disappears. As Geoffrey Batchen puts it, in order to see what the photograph is of, we must first suppress our consciousness of what the photograph is in material terms. However, I would argue that any act of suppression is rarely successful in the long term, and the object will assert its influence in the way that we approach the image, whether or not we are completely aware of that impact. For instance, a six by four family, uh, sorry, a six by four image tends to speak of commercially printed amateur snaps from the high street vendor, setting up an expectation of what we are about to see before we've even engaged with the image. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as Elizabeth Edwards and uh, writes, these material characteristics have a profound impact on the way images are read, as different material forms both signal and determine different expectations and use patterns. But what of what those what happens when those expectations clash? In thinking about ordinary amateur family snaps, I'm reminded of the hybrid works of Gerhard Richter. In his overpainted photographs, he takes appropriated images that are being commercially produced, the family six by four size snap, sometimes blurry or badly composed, seemingly the ones that were rejected or never made it into the family album. These are then smeared, daubed and scraped with leftover oil paint from Richter's paintings. The gestural mark of the paint disrupts the smooth machinic surface, producing a hybrid that sits somewhere between the abstract painted canvas seen in the gallery space and the spontaneous amateur snap destined for the family album. These works have been described as hybrid, positing photographic objecthood via the explicit merging of mediums. Uh, that this reflexive work asks us to consider not only what is the photograph, but what, when does the photograph stop being a photograph? Here, image and surface battle for our consideration, and we are confronted by questions as we explore Richter's work. These two worlds collide into one space, and the collision of media draws attention to the flipping of registers as the eye switches back and forth between the textual surface and the seemingly familiar family narrative beneath, pushing to mind the different languages that occupy these distinct territories. How are we to read these objects? Beneath the thick swathes of paint, the image remains vaguely legible. Just enough can be made out, tempting the viewer to squint through the painted surface into the image space beyond. In encountering these objects, for me, I feel that the paint becomes a curtain which the viewer tries to potentially sweep aside as they engage in the process of trying to connect to the narrative below. In this way, it reminds me that I'm peering into photographs that originate from a time when such images were potentially of intimate family moments, save for the home, put in an album shared with close family and friends, a time when a film of 24 images had to last for an entire holiday. This compared with the current digital revolution, where vast quantities of personal images are traded and shared in a much wider and more public forum. In writing about photography, <clears throat> Willem Flusser describes the object as something that stands in our way. It is the matter or the stuff of the photograph that interferes with the transparency of the image, preventing the suppression of its objectness and halting the ability to look through the photograph as if it were a window on the world. Similarly, Langburnt states, Materials obstruct, disrupt, or interfere with social norms, allowing for repressed or messy substances and impure formations to surface. This idea of the object standing in our way seems unnervingly apparent in these images as the opacity of the paint brutally reminds us of the surface of the constructed photographic canvas. The work of Wolfgang Tillman state, takes another step further away from the dominating influence of the image content to focus purely on the repressed material qualities of the medium. In some of his work, he draws attention to the very nature of the photographic process, unpicking and questioning what it might be to produce a photograph. 
In the lighter series, he produces photographs made without an external subject. More than that, the images are made without camera or lens, using only a photographic colour processor. The paper is passed through the machine, sometimes folded, and the effects of the machine on that paper produce the result. The creases and folds add a more sculptural effect, and the plexiglass box framing emphasises their physical objectness. The process of chemical production here is reflexively captured. It seems that the artist steps back and allows the machinic process to reveal itself. Tillmans has always been interested in this kind of technology, referring to his first camera as the photocopying machine which he used to enlarge found images, playing with abstraction and material process of production. He recalls how he became completely fascinated with this industrially fabricated paper, having no particular value but could be transformed into a beautifully charged, special and precious object through the touch of a button. He goes on to say, <clears throat> for me, that was the moment of initiation and the way that I actually came to photography. Thinking about this description of his experience and indeed my own box brownie images, it makes me wonder about the effect produced by the type of technology that we use in our first formative experiences and how those might shape us as artists. But that's perhaps research for another paper. <clears throat> um, in some of his work, the idea that Batchen put forward that we need to suppress the material quality to see what the image is of seems inverted. Here, these photographic objects appear to avoid the figurative in order to fully explore the material terms of photography, reversing this transparency towards opacity. So is it possible to explore materiality without abandoning the subject so completely? In his photo drop series, Tillmans incorporates the idea of physicality both in subject and object. These images are of sheets of curling photographic paper, their coloured gleaming surfaces turned inwards as the sharp edge of the paper frames the relationship between the front and the back of the object, both simultaneously visible. When exhibited, the scale and quality of the archival paper both absorbs the image of the inkjet prints and produces a gap between their physical surfaces, reminding the viewer of their differences. The clips that are often used to hang and present this work remind us of the three-dimensional object in front of us at the same time containing an image of another printed piece of paper, subject and object repeatedly interwoven. The abstract, abstracts, quality and often scale of his work speak of their relationship to abstract painting, but they also pose questions about our expectations of photography. In what ways can photographs reproduce reality? Where is the boundary between art and photography? And how much can materiality reflect the object's cultural value? Some of these ideas are taken up in the work of Anne Collier. Here, an exploration of both subject and object in relation to images enable the photograph as cultural object to be examined. She re-photographs appropriated images following artists such as Sherry Levine. However, her images are also based in a still life tradition as she carefully pays attention to the material car carrier or context of the image which is stripped from Levine's work. Existing commercially printed forms from the 60s, 70s and 80s popular culture, such as posters, records and magazines, are collected and then photographed against crisp backgrounds. The images she produces scrutinise the acts of looking and owning images and the commodification of the female body in the media. At the same time, keeping the viewer's attention focused on the materiality of the photographic object, exploring the physical forms that carry these images in our social popular culture. They seem to demonstrate the idea expressed by Kim Timby, who writes of the physical aspects of a photograph, process and presentation, being inextricably tied to the meaning of the work, or the photograph as a socially salient object. Her image folded Madonna poster, in brackets, Stephen Mizell, tells us directly what we are looking at. And by including the original photographer's name in the title, we are also aware of the differing commodity value of the original image compared to the lower status of the easily folded poster. The crease in the image repeats this message in the title, reminding us that we are looking at an existing object. By re-photographing the poster, another layer of meaning, value and looking is added. <clears throat> in her ongoing series, Woman with Camera, she explores the dynamics of power in the act of taking a photograph. This image is of Faye Dunaway. Um, it's a publicist shot for the 1978 film Eyes of Laura Mars. So she's photographed this actual photograph. The text underneath describes the female character and then lists all the men involved in the film production. Here the woman potentially has the ability to take back control of the looking process as she holds the camera. Another image in this series is this fashion shot of Ma Marilyn holding a camera in a glossy photo book. Here the camera appears an accessory, 
symbol of the male gaze that consumed the actress, held in a way that covers her mouth but not her eyes. The book in Collier's image is covered in brightly coloured post-it notes, place markers for image, images that require re-examining or further investigation by the imagined owner of this photo book. Added to their viewing is also Collier's gaze as she adds another layer of scrutiny, and this is added to by our looking at her images. Here it's possible to see why Regis Durand see the photograph as an object that lacks all certainty because it requires so many different acts of looking, durations of engagement and types of attention, and her images seem to acknowledge that complexity. Despite the historic nature of these images, her work seems highly relevant as our culture continues its obsession with, with celebrity images and sharing of portraits in a social context, which we've already touched on today. Um, her images seem to question how far our attitudes have actually changed the way we regard women in popular culture. Joanna Sassoon writes of the photograph being a multi-layered laminated object, reminding us that we need to consider the relationship between content, context and materiality. And these images seem to embody this idea, layering the subject and image, surface, production values, cultural context and the different levels of the gaze. So I want to shift things slightly now and go back to a question from the beginning of the presentation, whether this interest in materiality can be considered as a response to the rise in the digital format. Many of our social and cultural images are viewed via the web, and there are vast quantities of images shared and passed around. Our lives are flooded with digital images, shared, uploaded, passed on and discarded, while we find the next better version. So as artists and photographers, how do we deal with this flood? One artist, Anastasia Samlova, deals with it directly, trawling through the internet and appropriating copyright-free images collecting the most frequently shared or popular, printing them out and constructing them in sculptural and geometric shapes. These objects are then arranged with mirrors and photogels as small installations which then become re-photographed. In her series, Landscape Sublime, she produces these constructions from landscapes and details of natural beauty collected from the web. These picturesque caricatures of the sublime or of nameless places in their overwhelming numbers, just part of another internet search system, shared and favourited. She says of her own work, I was really interested in this idea of sharing images and the images that are meant to be used, but barely ever encountered in a physical form. Unless you make a trip to a gallery to see work, you rarely encounter pictures in a materialised form. In printing and constructing, the artist shows her desire to engage with these images and rebuild something from this flattened mass. The process of looking and making expands and contracts as the images move between physical and digital locations. Ideas of scale and the relationship between the physical or pictorial space are important here. These images are of grand, enormous, sublime spaces, converted into tiny thumbnail images on the web. They then become enlarged for printing by the artist and constructed in a way that both fragments but also rebuilds new environments. Having been re-photographed, the new construction will most then likely be re-experienced via the web. <clears throat> As Elizabeth Edwards states, an object cannot be fully understood at any single point in its existence, but should be understood as belonging in a continuous process of production, exchange, usage and meaning. As such, objects are enmeshed in an active social relations, not merely passive entities in these processes. Here the artist explores the sharing of use value and cultural meaning embedded in these images. Her method of making echoes the idea of a continuous process of production as the photograph is shared, taken, printed, re-photographed and re-shared, moving between spaces, context and value systems. These examples of digital images are printed and constructed to give them a material reality. <clears throat> but what of the digital image that remains consistently in a digital format? Can this also explore issues around materiality? In contrast to some of the processes and ideas of the material stuff I've covered so far, you might suppose that the digital format has little in common with such physicality. Sally Mann, a photographer using analogue processes, rejects digital forms in her own work as she believes the digital image is like vapour. It simply circulates bodiless and has no material reality. But in a similar way to the dust collected on the surface of a physical print or the damage acquired over time that suggests the usage of a handled photograph, even digital images acquire unexpected additions that point to their construction or handling, giving them a kind of materiality. Most of us who have dealt in digital images and saving files to various devices will have come across the annoyance of the glitch, that odd stripe or colour or pixelation when the file save has gone awry. This kind of accident betray betrays the image's analogical perfection of reality, which is described by Bart. 
These physical aspects which reveal something of the process of its making stand in the way of the transparent image and speak of a kind of physicality. In chemical-based work, there are many artists who exploit the dust which attaches itself to an image, the layer that sits on top of the surface, reminding us of the physical making process and the labour which produces that object, or the passage of time and the process of damage and decay that will befall such a physical object. Lang Burns writes of George Bataille's concept of base material, which points to ruin, relic, decay and decomposition, a version of material that is antithetical to the smooth surfaces of capitalist consumer goods and corresponds with our own mortality. The developing field of glitch art does seem to play on similar ideas, disrupting the continuous flow of images and the perfection found in the media. <clears throat> Artist Sabato Visconti has explored these coding accidents and developed them in order to make specific glitching processes visible in his art making and describes how glitch art has grown in opposition to the saturation of digital media in our everyday lives. Visually, they feel a lot like Richter's overpainted photos as a full immersion into the original image is denied. Glitching draws attention to the movement of images, the invisible processes that occur to shift them around. The coding that distorts the images reminds us that these digital images are not as permanent or stable as we might believe, and despite their seeming analogical perfection with reality, they are just another form of object. There are those, as I have said, would argue that a digital image has no material reality, and by implication, Joanna Sassoon asserts this, writing, the digital form can be seen in one context as a truer version of photography, writing with light, than those that require the creation of a physical intermediary to view the image in a material form. However, I want to briefly consider whether digital images are actually as free from these material forms and carriers as some would have us believe, or of the physical intermediary that supports the image in our act of seeing it. The digital image is only given form through various technological devices, whether phone, computer, television or projection. These add context to our understanding in a similar way to other pre presentational or framing objects. These pieces of technology have a cultural use value that adds another layer of meaning to the image. <coughs> Yet these forms of technology currently seem invisible to some in a similar way to the material carrier of the image that seemed partially invisible to Bart. I want to ask whether they only become visible or acknowledged once the technology becomes obsolete and these objects then become subsumed into art practice. Equally, <clears throat> many digital images require a certain level of embodied performance. Think about the insertion of a mobile phone into a conversation as the image is shared. The material carrier of the Facebook layout gives a specific social and cultural status to the image on this platform. The images have also become part of a performance that its users engage in as they share information with their audience. I stand now in front of you, in front of this projection with its creased um, screen. <laughs> which is quite useful for me. Um, and it sets up on a simplistic level the expectations of you, the audience, in this kind of performative display. All of these carriers are adding meaning to our, these images and photographs in a social and historical context. So the act of critically considering the material aspects of a photograph, including the choices made in the generation of that object, whether in relation to its production and labour value, its social context, or the meaning added considering the critical reading process, becomes a methodolog methodological way of thinking about working with and producing images. Antonio Negri has recently written that the materialist field is productive and this production passes through the flesh. This sets up the idea of embodiment here in relation to photography and the generative nature of materiality. Edwards and Hart acknowledge that material forms create very different embodied experiences of images and very different effective tones or theatres of consumption. In framing the debate in this manner, it is possible to consider a performative account of the photograph in the experience of the sensory elements that we experience in viewing and handling images, as well as thinking about the way that we theorise about photographs. Materiality, as I've said, connects to our physical presence in the world. It reflects our humanness and the imperfections of the bodily experience. Karen Barad calls for a performative account which insists on understanding, thinking and theorising as practices of engagement with and as part of the world in which we have our being. And she acknowledges the importance of materiality in this regard. The material nature and construction of these photographic objects pushes our engagement beyond a passive spectatorship. The transformations and the physicality of the material qualities require the photograph to become an active part of our relationship with image, process, object, and cultural values. I believe it is a rich and 
generative field of inquiry and as artists and photographers we can actively seek to use materiality productively. Thank you. Thank you.